All right, so some of the topics that we're going to cover today, we'll do some general user group business, kind of go around the room, uh, do some some introductions. Um, but then, as usual, we'll cover our you know monthly new feature updates. Um, we're going to have a feature presentation from Mike Thomas um, on um, user experience in Power BI. And um, then Sam is going to cover um, some more um, advanced deployment techniques using data flows and is going to cover a, uh, a feature of the shape map that allows some, some custom map creation. Um, uh, definitely see quite a few new faces here, so uh, welcome everybody. Um, since we didn't, I know Gina mentioned it, but uh, we did just start the recording and transcription. So um, if you would like to not you know, be on that recording, you know, now would be the time to, to drop. Um, we do make the recording available um, on our website. So folks who miss the meeting can come and catch up on uh, some of the latest technologies and um, uh, just general um, Power BI knowledge. So. Uh, one of the things that we like to do, um, especially when you know there's some new names and faces, um, is go around the room and do uh, introductions. No pressure if you um, are not comfortable, um, you know, stating any or all of these. You know, uh, just feel free to come off mute and uh, do a quick intro. Really looking for folks to you know say what their name is, you know, what company they're working for or industry, and either you know, a BI challenge or, you know, what they're hoping to get out of participating in this group or, um, you know, even ideas for future topics, uh, always looking um, for people to participate. So I'll, I'll start, uh, Jared Brown, Vice President of Data and Analytics at Talon. Um, we are based out of Glastonbury, Connecticut, where we typically do these events in person. Um, you know, fortunately and unfortunately, we're virtual now, so we don't have the opportunity to get together and, you know, have some food and drinks. But at the same time, we um, do have the ability to uh, get folks from, you know, all over the country and um, international as well on uh, several occasions. So um, as far as, um, you know, the goal of this group really to kind of take the knowledge that, you know, we've learned about Power BI and kind of advocate for it throughout the community. And also, you know, it's a ever evolving product. So um, always uh, a great opportunity to learn uh, more. So um, anybody else want to go next? Yeah, I'll go. Uh, I'm James Airy. Uh, I'm a lead consultant at Talon. Um, as Casey mentioned, I am also a Microsoft fat fast track recognized solution architect uh, for Power BI. Luckily they gave me this little plaque so I can actually read off the read off of the letters uh, whenever I need to say it. Um, but uh, yeah, so been working at Talon for almost a decade now and uh, doing a lot with like data projects, data platform stuff, but my most recent Power BI challenge is now getting my head back into Power BI from six months ago. Uh, because we're doing some uh, report server work on one of my clients and uh, just not having the latest and greatest is is uh, is troubling. Mm, because report server lags the Power yep. BI desktop by a few months, yeah. Yep. yeah I, I can uh, go next. Uh, my name is Sam Kelly. I am a senior consultant here at Talon. Uh, I've been with Talon for a couple of years now, uh, doing a lot of Power BI related work. <clears throat> uh, more recently, focusing on Power BI governance. Um, and I'd say my goal in participating in this user group is to help other people learn some of the small tips and tricks that can make your life easier with Power BI, as well as learn from others. Because uh, there's there's so much with Power BI, you know, it's hard it's hard to know the tips and tricks with everything. I'll go ahead and go next. I can, uh, I'm Greg. I can, go, I can go if you want. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Daryl. I'll go after. OK, um, I'm Daryl Malott, but I'm actually in California driving on a highway trying to get to my computer. But I, I've been using Power BI for a couple of years, and I've been, I'm in the construction industry. And it's been uh, most beneficial, but I'm always willing to learn more stuff. Great. Well, be careful where you're driving. No, no watching the, the demos. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, happy to have you. Um, 
my name is Graham Atkinson. I'm uh, another senior consultant with Talon. Um, I work pretty much exclusively with Power BI these days. Um, I guess I don't really have a recent challenge. There's there's always small challenges that come up, of course. But um, I did observe a BI trend recently, which was cool to see. Um, which is we were building out a dashboard for um, you know, the state of Connecticut for the COVID reporting. Um, so we looked at kind of all of the other states uh, in the U.S. and how they were doing their reporting. And you could really tell that the leaders among them were using Power BI. And it was really cool to see that kind of, um, you know, <laughs> you could see the states that put in the effort and you could really see the effort show um, in those Power BI reports. Um, I won't name any state names, but uh, there's some impressive ones out there. I'll go next, if that's okay. Uh, Sean Donovan, I'm a technical specialist at Microsoft. I've been here for about three years. Uh, prior to going to my current role, I was actually working at Microsoft Consulting Services, uh, doing Power BI implementations, as well as like analysis services, patching reports. Um, recent BI challenge, uh, for fun, I actually built a Power BI report using uh, fantasy football data, so I wanted to uh, figure out who to draft and uh, take my friend's money um, for that. So I actually extracted data from uh, NFL.com and then used like what if parameters to calculate the list of players in order who I should draft. Um, it's actually pretty cool. Um, and my goal to participate in this user group is to get a chance to communicate with uh, other members in the community. Sean, did you win I did the uh, week exact one? Same thing, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. I did not. Uh, I drafted Josh Allen. So ah. Not a good start so far. All right. Hey, yes. Yeah, so. I actually did that too, by the way, guys. I, I used Power BI to create it and I actually won my first week. <laughs> uh oh. Someone's report's better than the others. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> if it's any consolation, uh, my wife actually used the same report then she won her first week. So there you go. It's there you go. 50 50. <laughs> Yeah, I'll go next. Uh, hey everyone, uh, my name is Casey Philcox. I'm a software engineer currently at Travelers. Um, my biggest BI trend, I wouldn't say it's uh, a BI or biggest BI problem. Uh, right now I'm trying to get Travelers to approve uh, Power BI as <laughs> an approved uh, software because it's killing me that uh, I like using Power BI just for like day-to-day -day things, right? Like Excel's great, but I realize without having it that uh, I just want it to, you know, do day-to-day -day operations on stuff, and uh, so I'm working through that right now. Uh, yeah, nice to see everyone. Uh, Anybody I'll, else? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, my name is Emma Blecker. I'm the chief of staff for a restaurant group based in New York City, Chicago, and DC, and soon to be Nashville. Um, I've been working with Power BI for a couple of years. A little obsessed with it, self-taught, um, and it's become a pretty big uh, asset to our company. Um, it's a bit of a white space in the restaurant business in terms of data aggregation and, and operational insights and visualizations for small to mid-sized restaurant groups. There are some solutions for bigger ones, but not our size, and yet we rely on them, especially as we're a scaling business. So um, it's been a really fun process. I am the, the one-woman show, so I handle uh, architecture, pipeline, user experience and then some um something that i'm uh challenged with at the moment is um doing a big overhaul of our whole thing right now and trying to um get a sense of what people should be alerted to what should push out versus what's a pull what do people go into to find so there's a lot of fun in data, but especially for people without that background, like in restaurants, it can be analysis paralysis. So really understanding the right things for people to see at a glance versus all the fun stuff underneath. Great. Yeah, and that's honestly the best way to learn Power BI, really to find a, a, something that you're passionate about or um, you know, really kind of roll up your sleeves, dig in. So it's a great totally. story. I love the fact that you self-taught yourself uh, Power BI. I was in the same boat too. So I actually used uh, the Will Thompson uh, YouTube videos and mm -hmm. I was in a hotel room and just started to like go nuts with it. Yeah. So that's a cool story.
All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, um, you know, feel free, you know, either later on. Oh, was someone going to say something? Last, last chance? Yeah. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Bethany Silver. I'm the Chief Performance Officer for the Hartford Schools. And no one in th that I can find in, in my organization or certainly um, I'm looking in my industry for people who are using Power BI. And I'm such a newbie and really, really glad to be here and to find your group. Great, welcome. Yeah, we're, we've actually been doing some stuff for um, Office of Statewide Superintendents uh, of Schools in a different state, but uh, yeah, a lot of opportunity there for sure. A lot of data, especially you know these past couple of years. So, all right. Well, um, you know, we'll probably have some time at the end if anybody else you know feels like making an intro or has any you know other uh, stories they'd like to share. Um, for those that don't know, we've been meeting every other month. We we took a, a like a one month hiatus kind of over the summer because you know everybody's you know certainly anxious to get outside and and do things during that time frame. So uh, we give everybody a little bit of a break, but we'll get right back into our usual cadence. Uh, always willing to do more or less depending on you know volunteers or demand. Um, you know, we are, um, you know, always looking for, you know, folks willing to contribute. Could be just an idea that you're, you know, interested in or a question that you have, something that you want to present. Um, you could share your fantasy, you know, draft uh, reports uh, if, you know, there's a, an interest in that. Um, really anything. Um, we have, you know, uh, Mike Thomas is going to present today and definitely appreciate, uh, appreciative of that. Um, and also, too, uh, we're not really you know, meeting in person, but, you know, there's always opportunities to, you know, sponsor events um, as well. Um, you know, we used to get together, get food and beverage and, and had, you know, certain, um, you know, folks kind of come and present. Um, I do encourage uh, most of you join via the, the meetup link, which is certainly the easiest. Um, I do encourage you to check out the brand new Power BI community. It's community.powerbi.com. The URL to find our groups a little bit more challenging than it used to be. Um, we can always you know, throw it in the chat or the follow up. Um, the reason for joining the community is it gives you access to a lot of other resources. Um, uh, you know, if you have questions, you post them. People answer them immediately. You know, it's 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 really great. A lot of learning uh, resources, even some career um, resources as well. So definitely encourage folks to uh, to sign up uh, there. Um, so that said, we're going to kind of jump right into the main event, I think. Um, here was the agenda again. Um, so uh, we're going to start with Graham covering the, the new features. It's a, a few months worth, um, and he's going to get through, you know, as many as, you know, as, as he can. And then we're going to hand it over after that to, to Mike Thomas and then wrap up with, um, you know, Sam Kelly, you know, doing... Um, a few additional deeper, um, you know, uh, topic uh, demonstrations. So, I guess without further ado, Graham, you want to take uh, take over? Yeah, sure thing. Um, all right. So, for those of you that are unfamiliar, Power BI's kind of release cycle is a, a monthly cycle. So every every month they release a set of updates, and on their blog, um, you can see what those updates are month to month. Um, I have collected the last three months, and let me just get my screen shared here. Um, I've collected the last three months of June, July, and August. September's is not quite out yet. Um, and put the kind of key updates, the most important ones that uh, people should know into um, a PowerPoint. So I'll just talk about these um, for these three months, uh, go over kind of the the big bullet points and and give a, a quick um, explanation of what each of these mean. And then I have a very quick demo at the end where I want to talk about some of the exciting ones and the ones that are easy to show off. Um, so starting out in the month of June, um, the, most of these are going to be broken down into which sections of Power BI, um, you know, whether it's the desktop application, the service, uh, the mobile view, sometimes the analysis, um, which sections these updates occur in. Um, so we'll start in the reporting section in the month of June. Um, so the, the first update here is the paginated reports visual um, was added as a preview feature. 
Um, this is a, a visual that's been talked about a lot, has had a lot of requests, and was finally released in June. Um, it's released as a preview feature, um, and I always explain what that means just in case people are not familiar. Um, in Power BI, if you go into options and settings and then into preview features, there's a list of features that are not out of the box Power BI enabled, but you can opt in and you can start seeing those features in your reports. And this is one of those features. So if you enable paginated reports visuals as a preview feature, you'll be able to use this new visual. Um, and what this visual is, is kind of a window into the Power BI service to see any paginated reports that you've published up to the Power BI service and actually um, display those reports within um, you know, a regular Power BI report. Um, so there's there's all sorts of use cases for that, um, and I'm sure that you can imagine a few. It, I think it also allows uh, filtering with parameters for those reports, um, but just a, a cool new tool that's available um, if you choose to opt in. Uh, the next um, update. Hey, hey Graham, for, for those that don't know what paginated reports are, do you want to just give a like a brief description of, of that? You might be able to give a a better synopsis yeah. than I think. All right, so anybody who's used like SSRS in the past, think of them as like the the you know uh, the pixel perfect reports. I like, think like an invoice or a report that's going to span multiple pages that you might want to print as a PDF or whatever else. So Power BI, you think of you have like that view where it's interactive, you know, and you're slicing and dicing. Paginated reports are a bit more fixed. But you know, there's certainly cases where that's important if you are going to print them, or um, you know, you want to have you know something that you can you know provide to a customer, tons of data, um, you know, you name it. So this this feature lets you kind of embed those paginated reports directly in a regular Power BI report. So do those paginated reports have to be deployed? Sorry, what was? Yeah. So, so it's like a, first all, if you yeah, have a, I'll answer you, James, first, because um, that's easy. They do have to be deployed. They have to exist on the Power BI service. So you have like a paginated report out in the service. In Power BI, you connect to that report, and it's displayed in the visualization. So, and in the visualization, at least from the, the photos I've been able to find, it looks like you can select like the filters on it. Um, do you know if you're able to filter it via the data, the content on the page itself? So I would imagine that if you're putting, say, a measure as a filter, um, and then you filter that measure with a different slicer on the page, I'd imagine that that works. Unfortunately, I haven't had a lot of time to play with it. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not for sure certain that you can. I could okay. confirm you can. And awesome. just to so you ask like a Go ahead. Um, so does that allow for kind of embedding printability? on a visual inside an unpaginated report? Yeah, you could absolutely think of it that way. If you want, you know, within your report, sure, you can have all the kind of flashy interaction, but then you can also have, you know, this, as Jared described it, this kind of pixel perfect report inside um, that's going to, you know, show up exactly how you want it to look. So there are a few other caveats here, and I don't want to spend too much time, but paginated reports do require an additional level of licensing. Um, there are very affordable ways to achieve that, so I don't want to you know discourage people to think that you know you need to you know have a, a huge investment, but you know just something to keep in mind. Yeah, um, we won't spend too much time on this uh, now, but if you do have questions later, feel free to ask. Um, so the next update um, under reporting is the area chart transparency. Um, it used to be fixed at 60% for all area charts. Um, it now has a slider. I did some playing around with this. Unfortunately, you can't do that. You can't have like a conditional transparency setting, and you can't um, choose certain areas to have different uh, transparency settings. But you can, for example, make it completely opaque or make it very transparent, whatever you want. You can now control that within your area charts. Um, in continuous axes charts and Cartesian planes, uh, you can now set inner padding between um, you know, lines. Uh, I'll show this off later. Um, pretty simple, but say you have like a, a date axis and then you have a count of like profit for each day. Um, you know, with no padding, that's going to look like 
um, you know, a filled curve. It's just going to be a solid shape. If you add padding, you start to kind of see um, the different days as they're broken down. You can see spaces between those lines. Um, so kind of cool to be able to control that. Um, that's something that was a little bit lacking in the past, and now you're able to do that. Yeah, more, um, and, more and more features you're seeing that you're you're kind of used to in like like Excel traditionally becoming available. So um, I, I think it's just going to be a continuous evolution until they reach parity, maybe. But yeah, that's a good one. And that that is kind of what we've seen over the past year is more than that is just along with the big updates that they roll out, there's usually like one or two big updates that they roll out per month. There's all of these kind of like quality of life features um, that do make it feel more and more like a Microsoft product that is user friendly and has high customization. Um, so the last uh, update here is for small multiples. This is a feature that we've kind of gone back to time and time again and talked about. Um, it was a preview feature for a long time actually in the month of june it still was a preview feature we'll see that it comes out of preview next month um but small multiples is essentially a different a, a way that's not a legend um to break down like a line chart or a bar chart um i'll show that off uh, a little bit later as well um but they've added a few small adjustments in the month of moon uh month of june excuse me um they added some responsiveness options. So when you're shrinking and expanding the visual itself, um, this allows you to kind of choose what elements of the visual are staying there when it starts to run out of space and what's getting lost. Um, so most, most visuals in Power BI are responsive in that if you have a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of legends, like pieces of your legend, like say there's a bunch of uh, you know countries or something you're breaking it down by. If you start to shrink down the visual and it starts to run out of space for the actual chart, it'll just cut out the legend entirely so that you can still see that chart space. Um, and they've added that for small multiples, which is a little bit more complicated because small multiples is a bunch of charts in one. Um, don't need to go too into depth in depth there. Um, but that's the idea. Um, and then they've also added some conditional formatting for small multiples. So you can now control the background color of each of your small multiple charts, um, as well as uh, the title. Um, and I will show that. Um, and it does say preview feature next to it, as you can see. Um, as I said, in the month of June, small multiples was a preview feature that you had to opt into. Um, but now it's actually just available out of the box. Um, so let's move on to updates to the service from June. Um, the first, and I think this is kind of the biggest update overall to the system, is um, data sets discoverability. So what they did was now when you promote or certify a data set, by default, that data set becomes discoverable by everybody within your organization. Um, the data set has to be promoted. You cannot share a non-promoted data set, and that's to promote data integrity. Um, but once it is promoted, and you can opt out of this if you choose to, but once it is promoted, it becomes discoverable. And now people can go into a list of data sets within the Power BI service, um, and they can see everything that has been um, promoted within their organization. Um, and then kind of going along with this, um, the next bullet point here is they can request access to those data sets that they don't currently have. Um, so this would allow them to say, you know, there's a, a data set that they they didn't realize existed. They see it and they realize that they need this for a report that they want to make. Um, there's now a button that they can click that will, um, you know, one setting you could have is that it will email the owner of that report. Um, you could also have it so that, you know, there's an information page that comes up that tells them either how to request access or how to gain access. Um, so they're kind of trying to build upon interactivity and collaboration. Um, always good to see. Uh, and I think that this kind of type of sharing is something that's been a little bit lacking. I think it's still a little bit limited, um, but it is good to see. Um, and then the next three updates, the last updates for June that I um, chose to include here are all to um, APIs. So the admin API is a powerful tool in Power BI, um, and there's some additional functionality added to it. Um, in June, you can now um, set and remove Microsoft information protection lo labels um, from data sets and reports. Um, but then uh, another cool thing that you can do now is you can actually automate and control your pipeline deployments. Um, so rather than having to go into a pipeline 
um, and say, you know, deploy this pipeline from development to test and test to production, um, you can now actually control that through an API. So that kind of opens up um, a window for, um, you know, having a smoother deployment process that doesn't involve going to a bunch of different places and moving things from place to place. Um, I will say that the governance and, um, you know, moving from different um, environments between dev, test, and prod is kind of a pain point in Power BI, and this doesn't completely fix that, um, but it, it is a step in the right direction of making that smoother. Um, and then the last bullet point here in June um, is APIs, um, not for controlling deployment pipelines, but kind of for the metadata around deployment pipelines and, and governance. Um, so admins can now like get a list of all deployment pipelines that exist in their tenant or they can go in and they can add or remove people um, um, to have or remove access to a deployment pipeline. So say for example, um, somebody in your organization created a deployment pipeline and then left the organization and now nobody can you know, do anything in that deployment pipeline. Nobody can deploy data. Um, it's kind of stuck. And before there was really no way to get in there. Um, now admins can from the API add somebody to have access so that they can then take over um, you know, deployments. Um, so that's everything for the month of June. Um, there's, there's a bunch of other smaller stuff that if you go to the website, you'll see like they're always adding um, you know, third party visuals to their promoted visuals and they're always adding new connectors. Um, I leave that stuff out of these slides just for um, conciseness, um, but there's always a list of you know, a whole bunch of other smaller updates. Um, so let's move on to July. In the month of, of July, there were um, a few updates, again, in reporting. Um, as I had alluded to previously, the small multiples is now generally available. So if you start Power BI brand new out of the box, you will see um, the ability to have small multiples. Um, what small multiples is, I realize I didn't explain that before. Um, well, I kind of did, but not as much as I could have. Um, you know, it is a way to categorize your data um, like a legend, but rather than having a legend of different colors, it splits it into a bunch of different charts that are all going to have a single like line or bar. Um, and like a legend, it's actually just another data well within your, your visual. So rather than dragging, say, product over to legend, you drag it over to small multiples and it creates, you know, X different charts for you. Um, where X is the number of products you have. Are you showing a demo of the small multiples after yep. this? Okay. Yep, I will show a quick demo after. Um, yep, so the next thing um, under the reporting section in July is conditional formatting um, for many more properties. Um, I kind of ex it blew this out into a list of all of what those are. Um, you know, you can you can read that list at your leisure, but um, they've essentially made it so that you have much more control over what's being called out. Um, you know, if something exceeds a rule or is a, the lowest value or whatever, however you might want to conditionally format something, um, you now have more options than just changing the color of the data bar. You can now have, um, you know, the legends have a specific color, like descending from, um, you know, highest to lowest, or you could have, um, you know, the label for the data have a different color, you know, all of these different ways to control it and, and have the functionality that you want um, your, your report to have. Um, again, always nice to have more control. The access start and end, that's huge. Um, there's so many times where I want to structure it, you know, in such a way that it only shows a certain number, you know, um, and you could do it, you know, manually, um, but yeah, that, that's, uh, that's going to be pretty nice. Yeah, you know, I've always had to like kind of artificially put a filter on a date range um, before it comes in um, or like, you know, figure out how you're going to filter that. Being able to control that within the visual um, for conditional formatting is definitely powerful. Um, the next bullet point here is Power BI's built-in visuals now include the Power Automate visual. Um, I, that's a really weird way of saying that Power BI's Power Automate is no longer in preview. I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> why they phrased it that way. Um, but I interpret this to mean that Power Automate Visual is now generally available. If you start Power BI, you will see the Power Automate Visual, which is kind of a, a bluish arrow in your visual box. It's towards the bottom. Um, and Sam did a demo, I think, last time on what the Power Automate Visual is. 
Um, I'm not going to go into that now, um, but it's you know, it's a cool visual that kind of it takes the reporting out of or it. So I, I don't want to miss sell what it is. Um, it allows you to make actions based on the data um, in Power BI. Um, and I, I don't think we're doing a demo, but if you if you are interested in what Power Automate is, you could probably look up. Um, is it last month that we did it? Could somebody? Does somebody I know? Say when we did it that? was two months ago, or three. Um, anyways, we've gone over it in the past, and and we could probably pull up a, a video on that if you are interested. Um, and then the the last thing under reporting here is the sensitivity labels in Power BI are now generally available in Power BI desktop specifically. Um, so this means that um, they're, they're constantly like making changes to the sensitivity labels. This has been kind of an ongoing thing for many months now. Um, in the past, they haven't focused as much on Power BI desktop, more in the service. Um, but now in Power BI desktop, you can protect your data and label your data. So when somebody opens your Power BI report, um, it'll show up in in kind of the very bottom. There's a little tool tip that will say what the uh, what the data is labeled as. Um, you can also change your sensitivity label um, within Power BI Desktop though. Um, under modeling here, um, one small change: the new model view, which was previously in preview, is now generally available. Um, you've probably seen it if you've used Power BI in the last two months. Um, it's really nice. It looks really good, um, and it's now the default behavior. Uh, and finally, in the service section, um, and this first bullet point I think is the most exciting out of all of the updates we're going over, um, is the streaming data flows preview. Um, I unfortunately did not have time to set up a demo for this, um, but what this is is if you have a live data set that's you know constantly being added to or updated. Um, this allows you to stream from a source into Power BI service and from Power BI service into Power BI desktop um, and, and build your report around. Um, it's almost always going to be a, a direct query, um, you know, basically what's called hot data, data that's constantly being changed. Um, the example that they kind of gave in their blog for this month was um, data around tolls on a highway and you could see you know it would update within the power bi report it would update every five seconds it would refresh the page and you could see that this number was constantly changing um, because the data flow itself is constantly pulling in um, data as it becomes available um, there, there's more and more ways that power bi is supporting like this real-time streaming data scenarios um, like there's another ver another you know, feature coming out that's called hybrid tables that's going to be really exciting um, that supports a combination of you know imported and you know direct query data to an underlying source um, so you know there might be a pug if there if, if there's interest let us know and maybe th if there's a um, a specific pug where we could focus on a couple of those different options is that um, a premium feature or is it on plot uh, pro as well um, so data flows themselves are a premium feature. Uh, uh, so this, not not entirely. There's certain parts of data flows that require premium. Pro, yeah, yeah. But um, you could achieve quite a lot with um, you know data flows without premium. The mm -hmm. other thing that you could do with data flows, and Sam, I don't know if you're covering this though, so, um, is connect it to your own data lake. Um, so if you're streaming data into your own data lake, they just it, can just show up as part of your data flow. So there's a couple cool uh, things that we can cover there too. The other thing I wanted to add on this streaming data flows, um, keep in mind that this is in preview. Um, so it's once again, not available out of the box, but something that's going to be coming down the line. Um, but one of the things that they showed off and I found really impressive was how intuitive building a data flow seemed to be. Um, it's kind of just a, a drag and drop um, you know, you're dragging steps into your data flow. There's, you know, different logic steps you could drag in, filtering steps, um, you know, group buys. You can pretty easily create the tables that you want to create out of your data flow without really any knowledge of the underlying languages that are doing that, whether it's M or DAX. Um, so that that did seem quite cool. 
Um, but again, it's in preview. We'll probably see more about this um, in the months to come. But I am personally quite excited about that. Um, anybody want to make a comment or question on that before we move on to the next one? Don't want to cut people off if they're interested. OK, um, the next uh, bullet point here is um, mandatory label policy. Um, so within the tenant settings, the Power, uh, Power BI admin can you know, set a label policy for the entire organization, um, which requires Power BI reports to have a data label. So this would prevent somebody from creating a report and publishing it and not you know, labeling their data. It's, they're always going to have to specify, should this be protected? Um, if not, you know, that's fine, but they're always going to have to basically tell the users what, what kind of data is in the report. Um, and then the, the final point here is you can now set up a custom help link for sensitivity labels. So if your organization is defining their own sensitivity labels for your data, um, you know, a link will appear next to that label that will bring you to a custom page that you build um, to show you or to show the user uh, what that label means. Um, so a bunch of stuff on sensitivity labels, and I think we'll see a little bit more of that in the month of August. So. So real quick back on the streaming data flows. So streaming data flows specifically, the documentation says it's going to be part of premium capacity or premium per user. So you will need that additional license. Um, you know, the entry point, as I had mentioned earlier for premium per user is pretty low. It's just an additional 10 bucks on top of your pro license. Uh, but then, you know, only folks who have that license, uh, that premium per user license can use it. So, um, um, but, uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, you know, still worth, you know, taking a look um, because there's a couple of different ways to license premium um, for sure and uh, see if, you know, it meets your criteria. But there's always other ways to make things happen too. So if that's like a, nice. you know, a non-starter, then there's, you know, it might take a little bit more work, but you can kind of achieve the same thing slightly different ways. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. OK, so moving on to our last month, the month of August. Um, September's updates are not out yet, um, but you know, the next time we meet, we'll, we'll be going over those. Um, so here in the month of August, um, under reporting, um, a few kind of smaller ones this time around. Um, the ability to customize the shapes that were reworked about four or five months ago um, has been added. Um, so when they reworked the, uh, the shapes in Power BI, um, they, they changed it from, you know, having five shapes available to having uh, like 50 or something shapes available. And they, they made it so that those shapes can be um, interacted with and kind of displayed in a bunch of new ways. You can have glows, you can have shadows, um, you can do all kind of the cool stuff with your shapes. Um, what they've added here in August is even further customization of the actual shape of your shape. Um, so you can now make your your arrow, um, you know, less pointy if you want to. Um, so always cool to see, you know, once again, having more control over what your report looks like um, and more customization. Uh, the next bullet point here is for the X axis constant line. Um, this is a feature that we I remember we talked about towards the beginning of the year was the X axis constant line. They've added a few additional things to that. Um, and I will touch on what those are later, um, but they're, they're, what I found strange about this is they made these changes to your x-axis constant line, but not your y-axis constant line. Not exactly sure why that is. I'm sure we'll see y-axis constant line changes in the future, um, but really what the changes are is you can now shade to the left or right of your line. Um, you can control the, um, the, the color a little, better like conditionally with conditional formatting. Um, and I think I think they changed uh, some transparency on that as well. So you can set um, how visible it is. Um, but once again, uh, I will show that off in a quick demo right after this slide. Um, and then the last thing under reporting is the ability to set a default sensitivity label um, policy in Power BI Desktop. Um, so this is under reporting, even though it's something you change in the service. So this is a tenant setting. Once again, 
Um, so a Power BI admin would go in and apply this to the organization, but it only affects Power BI desktop files. So that's why it's under reporting here. Um, but what this does is, you know, if you remember, there was that setting to um, require sensitivity labels on reports. You can take that one step further and say every report that gets published is going to have this sensitivity label unless somebody goes in and changes it and says, oh, the state is actually more secure than that. Um, so, you know, rather than making your users specify every time, there's going to be a default if you opt in for this setting. Um, that's in preview, so not something that you'll see out of the box. You have to opt in. Um, under modeling, there is a new way. Oh, this is another exciting one. There's a new way of expressing date and date time values in um, DAX. So. Previously, in order to build a date or a date time object in DAX, you needed to use a function. You needed to use the date function um, or pull it from your data somewhere. Um, and it was just kind of awkward to handle and use. Um, and now, just like a, a text string or a number, um, you can define a date um, you know, in line in your data. Um, and I'll show what the format is for that. Uh, and then in the service section here, just two more updates. Um, sensitivity labels have been added for paginated reports. So Jared talked about what paginated reports are earlier. Um, you can now apply sensitivity labels to those as well. Uh, and finally, um, the Power BI API now supports DAX queries. Um, and this is another one that I wasn't able to do a huge amount of research into research into what this entails. Um, I do know that it was a highly requested feature to be able to kind of query your data um, and, and use the API using DAX. Um, so I, I can't speak too much on you know what that actually allows for, um, but it is exciting to see. Yeah, and I haven't had a chance to use it either, but I mean, think of having an application that you wanted to pull some data and present, you know, in a custom, you know, experience, um, you know, outside of Power BI, you can query the model, get that same exact calculation, that same exact number that the reports would create. So you can be, you know, certain that you're performing the calculation the same way um, and the data will always be consistent. I'm sure there's tons of other applications. Data extract scenarios might not be the most performant, but um, there's, uh, I think, broad applicability. Um, I can imagine using like creating like a chat bot that, you know, can you know return answers to questions. There's I, I think there's there's a lot that could be done. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that definitely opens the window for some cool stuff. Um, any other questions or comments on the features before I get into a demo? Um, I just realized that I am at <laughs> my time limit, so I'll do the demo fairly quickly. Um, it's not going to be too in-depth. It's just uh, showing off some of the uh, some of the features we talked about here. And if you have any questions for me on anything that we talked about, um, I can try to show that as well. Uh, my computer really doesn't like how many Power BI desktops I have open at the moment. Give me one second. So while Graham gets that set up, anybody have any questions about any of the other topics he's covered? Or? So, um, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Actually, no, if you're, if it's your, go ahead. Um, okay. Yeah. So while that other Power BI report loads, I can show off the, the padding that I was talking about. So this is a report that um, we put together for um, Connecticut. It's a publicly available report. It's just why I can show it, but it is COVID cases over time um, since the start of collection. Um, and this is currently um, a continuous date axis um, and just counts per day. So what we can do now with our axis padding is if we go into X axis and go over to our padding. If we increase this, we'll see more white space. And decrease, we'll see less. Now it doesn't make a huge difference with um, bar charts that are, you know, this with this many data points, if I kind of zoom in, 
um, we can see a little bit more. With zero padding, we can see very distinct lines um, with less, or sorry, other way around. Um, we can see you know, very much white space, and with less, we, we have larger lines. Um, and once again, the axis is kind of blowing this up a little bit. Um, so our lines are very small still, um, but you can kind of get the idea of what this would allow for if you had, um, you know, an axis that didn't have quite so many data points. Um, and let's see if the other, yeah, okay. So this is the small multiples that I was talking about. Um, I've pulled in some sample data that Power BI makes publicly available. When you open Power BI, um, there's the option to use a sample data set. Um, and I tend to use that with these demos that I do, so that's what this is using. Um, these are not actual sales numbers for any company, it's just example data. Um, let's get this out of the way. So what we have here on the right is the small multiples feature. Um, so this is just a line chart. And if I take out country from small multiples, we can see that this is just profit over time. Um, it's broken down by months. So there's actually, um, it's going to be a little bit inaccurate because there's a, a year that I'm not accounting for, but you know, just for, just for the sake of demonstration. Um, now, if I wanted to categorize this by country, I could take this and what I'm sure everybody is aware of is I could put country into legend. So I can see now these sales broken down um, by color and those colors correspond to the five different countries. But it does make for a little bit of a busy chart. And if I had more than five countries, it would start to be really hard to understand what's going on here. So if rather than legend, I use small multiples, um, now it's actually going to break that apart into five different um, charts. So we can see the line for each of these, and it's very clear um, you know, how the Canada sales over time compares with um, you know, the US sales over time or, or whatever. Um, and the, the things that were changed with um, you know, these monthly updates was number one, if I were to resize this, um, you can see that it is keeping my axis values and it kind of looks pretty ugly. If we make it responsive, I actually forget where the setting is. Yeah, responsive. So with responsive um, turned off, you know, you can see that now this data, you have to scroll to see it all. And if we shrink it down even more, we start to you know, lose actual um, you know, color. We can't see the line here anymore. With responsive on, you can always see the line. You can always see the kind of necessary data. Um, responsive was kind of the um, default behavior of many of the other visuals, but it's not really a, a big deal because there's not many times that you or your users are going to be dynamically resizing the visuals on a page. Um, the more interesting change to um, small multiples is the conditional formatting. So if I go into um, data colors, oops, sorry, which one is this? I think it's grid, yeah, grid layout. Um, and background color, we can see that I have applied a function to the background color for these charts. Um, so if I if I clear it, it'll it'll be blank, and I'll have the option to hit the the effects. But I've simply um, said that it's um, going from red to white, descending um, where the the lowest value of sales is in red, and the highest value is more of a, a white hue. So we can see that um, over time, Mexico has the lowest sales. And this will dynamically update. Uh, we can also see here on this matrix that that is indeed the case. Mexico had 20 million um, worth of sales and US had the highest, which is why US is white. Um, if I were to select a single month, so we're only looking at January data, we can see that it is dynamic. It is going to 
um, you know, change those colors. So now Mexico is actually the highest. It's um, white, and Germany is our lowest. So Germany is the the most red one. Um, so you know, being able to have some, it, you can always apply conditional formatting to say, uh, you know, other colors, but specifically with um, small multiples, there was a little bit of a, a limitation on how you can conditionally format these. Um, and now you can kind of call out things that you want to show about them um, with a little bit more um, customization. So that's that's pretty much everything on small multiples. Did anybody have any questions on you know, the feature itself, these changes, anything like that? I got one, Graham. Sure. You can hear me. Um, is it possible when using small multiples? I know the x-axis is fixed across uh, all five charts there, which makes sense. You know, if we care more about trend as opposed to magnitude, is it possible to make the y-axis uh, not fixed, uh, independent? Um, so I, I think that the y-axis is always going to be fixed to certain values, but you can always use a measure rather than a, um, you know, a, a raw value. You can always use a measure when you want to talk about trend to kind of show it in relation to the others. Um, so that's a good question. Is that if you put a measure in for that start, right? Could you make that the min value, and would it be the min for just that multiple? It seems like it. That's actually a good question. Let's try that. It's interesting because, as you will see, you know, Canada and France are sharing the same axis. You know, because they're in the same row, but right. I mean, I don't see any reason you couldn't re, you know, recreate the axis. So can I use a measure here? Well, looks like it's not going to let me. Um, that well, in. you might have to hit that function thing, and then um, could you pick the measure? Yeah. So it might just evaluate once. So I could probably define that measure differently, um, you know, set a filter on country and have that measure have a different maximum value for each country. Um, although I'm not exactly sure how that would. I feel like it's work. only going to evaluate once for the whole visual, just because of you know the fact that it has a little function there. Um, that is a that's a good idea though. I'll have to try that. That's a good question. Um, I'll have to give that a shot. I, I would do it now, but I don't want to run too far into your time. Um, <laughs> what's um, what's the do you know what the multiple limit is for this in terms of total and by row and column? Yeah, so um, that's a good question. For the grid layout, you can define how many rows and columns. I'm not sure if they have a set limit on what you can define here, but if you start to add uh, a lot more data than just five, like let's say, for example, I took in um i don't know which of these actually has a bunch let's take months month name put that on my small multiples so now we have more and you can see that um, it's actually going to do um, month plus location so we have five times 12 so we actually have 60 charts now um, so we have a lot more, and it just is going to make us scroll through them. Um, so th there's no limit on the number of charts, but I'm not sure of the limit on the number of rows and columns that you define. And you can make the page bigger, but then you know you're you know you know uh, up against you know what's visible real estate and yeah you know, how small screens are and. I am yeah. curious now what happens if I define I actually <laughs> want 1,000 columns. It's just gonna, okay, six. Six is the limit. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I got really excited when I saw small multiples, but I struggle with that axis just being on the bottom, which I understand. But for things that are not intuitive, like months, it can be a little bit of a an up-down uh, reader experience to understand what you're looking at if you've got charts just so far above that X. 
yeah, that definitely that definitely does make sense. Um, you know, you can always make it so that there's a single row with a bunch of columns if you want the uh, if you want the columns or the, the x-axis to be easier to read. But um, it's not it's not the perfect solution, um, you know, for everything. It's it's useful to be able to use this, but you know, if if your x-axis really matters for the specific values, maybe it makes more sense to do a a legend or, or something like that. Um, okay, and the the last thing that I want to talk about before I hand it over is this x constant line. Um, so this one's actually kind of hard to find. Um, I never remember where it is, but if you have a chart that has an x axis and you go over to analytics, there's an x and a y constant line uh, drop down. Um, so under x constant line, you can put um, a value or um, a measure. You can you can put whatever you want in here. Um, I've chosen dates here. So this one here is a measure. Um, this is using new year, which I've defined as the first day of um, 2014. Using the new date time format. So this is that, you know, normally I'd have to do something like date um, 2014 1 1 um, to get this specific date. Um, but rather than that, I can just do it in line and just do DT, um, you know, the quote mark, and then the format is year, 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 dash, month, month, dash, day, day. Um, so anyways, I've defined new year as a measure. I've referenced that in my X constant line, and then I've referenced a specific date using their calendar picker um, for the first constant line, um, and I've thrown that into this chart. So we can see that everything before my first constant line has been shaded, and everything after my second constant line has been shaded um, which you control through this, you know, shade. You can control the shade transparency. You can put a data label. There's all sorts of formatting you can do on that. Um, but this is a really good way to show all of the data, but you know, call out a specific section, or you know, maybe show that some section of your data is like out of bounds or not within the um, some calculation. You know, whatever the use case is, being able to control these constant lines and shade the areas that they apply or don't apply to. Um, is a, a new tool that we have that uh, I think can be can be used to um, you know, many different use cases. Um, any questions on that? I, I want to try to wrap up here quickly. OK, doesn't sound like it. Um, well, thanks, everybody. Um, again, if you have any questions or, or think of anything that you want to add, um, feel free to ask later but i'm going to hand it over here and uh you know thanks for thanks for tuning in for the monthly updates thanks graham definitely a lot of uh updates to to cover when it's it's a three month gap but uh um definitely some exciting ones and i think there's a, a few more exciting ones coming so uh you know stay tuned for her next time as well um, all right, well, I guess we're handing it off to Mike next. So uh, Mike Thomas, Catchbook Brook Analytics, is going to talk a little bit about user experience in the um, authoring of reports. So take it away, Mike. Sure, let me see if uh, I could share here. Can you hear me and see the screen? I uh, can't see the screen. Screen, unless it's just me, but I can see this. I can, I can see it. All right, as you were, then <laughs> it's just I don't you, matter. Jared. <laughs> <laughs> How about uh, others on the call, maybe that are external? Yes, can see it. Jared, I can awesome. see it. Okay, thank you. So, um, thank you for the introduction, Jared. You know, I, I want to thank first thank Talon for for hosting these meetups. Uh, I know that I learn a ton of new valuable info at every one that I attend and I'm hoping to pay it back a, a little bit tonight. Um, I'm obviously not not nearly as well uh, in terms of my expertise as, as folks like Graham and, and those at Talon, um, but hopefully I can present a few tricks from, from kind of our design mindset at Catchbook that might help you out as you start getting into building uh, Power BI reports for the first time or you know, potentially uh, or, or a seasoned vet who's just looking to make some uh, continuous improvements 
to your existing Power BI reports. Um, you know, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your work day to stay on and, and join us tonight. Uh, it's not an easy thing to do, especially now that many of us are working from home. Um, but again, I, I'm going to talk about some ways that you can improve the design of your Power BI reports, and, and I think it should be equally applicable across you know, all areas of expertise. Uh, and please feel free to, to ask questions. You know, this is a meetup. This is dynamic um, at any time as they come up. You know, I'll ask Jared maybe to, to monitor the chat and, and let me know what's going on there because I, I don't think I could see it while I'm presenting. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm the chief data scientist at Catchbrook Analytics. My name is Michael Thomas. Um, we're a data science consulting firm based out of the Hartford, Connecticut area. We specialize in building end-to-end -end data science solutions from data management uh, to building and deploying predictive models to visualizing the output of those models in, in dashboards or web applications. And one of the motivations uh, for founding Catchbrook was seeing a lot of consultants in the data science space building really highly technical solutions uh, that were problems more than they were solutions. Um, because they didn't think about how it was going to fit back into the nuances of their client's business. Uh, they didn't spend enough time designing the solution up front to make sure that the end product was going to fit the needs of the users on the ground who have to work with that solution on a day-to-day -day basis. Those users don't care that, that we built some complex AI neural network on the back end. They just want something that works and, and makes their life easier. Um, and I think this extends to, to any analytics technology development, uh, including Power BI. So I'll also note that maybe my first uh, experience with Power BI was, was back in, in 2015, and I felt like I was on my own in exploring you know, all the different things that, that were possible with it at that time, which it wasn't nearly as much as what's possible with it today. You know, I found this group uh, about three years ago, the Hartford Pug Meetup group, and I've been you know, super grateful uh, to be able to find other people to nerd out uh, with about this kind of stuff. I truly believe that, that community learning is, is one of the best ways to learn, and I, I really appreciate all of Talan's time and effort uh, to host these meetups. So thank you guys. So I got super excited because Emma spoke earlier about worrying about reader experience um, on some of those small multiples, and, and I was so excited to hear that because I think it's, it's easy for us um, to get revved up about new functionality and, and try to incorporate the, the latest and greatest complex visuals in our Power BI report and forget that there's going to be someone on the other end of this that we're building this report for. So th there's a guy named Edward Tufte, uh, and he's kind of the godfather of data visualization. And he says that you should be able to look at a dashboard or, or chart and understand what's going on in 10 seconds or less. Um, I think that's super important nowadays, given that attention spans are, are at a super premium. Um, and your competition as a Power BI report de developer is every other app and dashboard that people interact with on a daily basis. And your audience is used to the user experiences of Facebook and Instagram, you know, maybe where they take for granted the fact that there are teams of hundreds or thousands of people working specifically to make sure that those apps are as user friendly as possible. And you're one person, you're just one person building out a Power BI reports. So when your audience interacts with an app or a dashboard that's that's difficult to navigate, they quickly lose interest. And I find myself doing that on websites that aren't super intuitive and I have a tough time you know, figuring out kind of where to start, I, I quickly become frustrated um, and lose interest and decide to look for maybe the next, the next best thing. Um, so this is all about uh, adoption, right? And, and it gives us this relationship that you know, I clearly had to build a data visualization for uh, between how easy to use our dashboard is and, and how likely it will be that folks will actually use it. You know, such that as we look on the x-axis to the right, the more time that it takes to understand the dashboard, you know, the less likely that it will be adopted uh, by the audience that you built it for across the y-axis. So I really, really hope that you have never been involved in this type of a conversation before, but, but we are in the midst of, of a dashboard adoptability crisis. Um, I think, unfortunately, this happens all the time in the real world. You know, a lot of our business at Catchbrook 
is actually getting called in to rescue a dying dashboard. Uh, probably as silly as that sounds, but you know, if, if the conversation goes like this, and, and me as the Power BI developer says, uh, you know, hey, is your team enjoying the dashboard that, that I designed for them a couple months ago? You know, I put all my blood, sweat, and tears into building this great dashboard. I've wrestled data from three different systems and two ugly Excel spreadsheets to get it to work. And, and now I find out that they say, oh, you know, you know we used it for a little bit, um, but we really haven't looked at it in a while. Uh, we kind of forgot that it even existed. And, and I find out that all that hard work that I put in isn't really even being used by the folks that I built it for. And this is what we want to avoid, right? And, and by having a design and user experience kind of front of mind during your entire development process, we can hopefully decrease the amount of conversations like this and, and increase adoption rates for the products that we build. So my first design tip that I'm gonna give out tonight is this concept called wireframing. And if you're not like a front end expert or, or designer, you might not have heard this, this word before at all. But wireframing is, is the process of actually sketching out the components of your dashboard before even building it. Um, you know, there are a lot of tools out there for doing this, but I actually love to sketch it out on pen and paper. Uh, wireframing, you know, forces you to think about how you're going to organize information up front, and, and it moves you away from just presenting a bunch of data to actually presenting useful information and that buzzword insight that we all like to talk about when we're talking about data. And, and wireframes are non-technical, right? There's something that you can present to your boss or the end user to keep the communication channels open throughout the development process so that you know, you're not kind of going away into your hole for three months developing the Power BI report and then coming out of it and saying, okay, here you go. And the deliverable is you know, 180 degrees from the idea that your end user had in their mind when they first approached you to ask you to build this report. And if you don't want to sketch out your wireframe by hand, you know there are a ton of tools out there on the web to help you build a wireframe. And one that we use often is called Lucidchart. I can bring it up here, I think, for a second. Um, I'm sure there's a lot better ones than this, but you know, literally, it's just kind of a, a almost like an architecture, you know, graph paper diagram where you can drag around different shapes. It'll give you some templates. You can change some colors. You know, you can shrink, uh, copy and paste, and just kind of sketch out ahead of time. You know, what you might think your dashboard page or pages um, should look like, and it's a helpful non-technical tool. I think to get you thinking about how you're going to present this information um, before you even go about building your, your dashboard itself. Um, I don't know if anybody can see this. Can you, can you see this, guys? Uh, barely. You can barely see it. So I, I actually <laughs> have a, a folder um, in my file cabinet with all wireframes of apps and, and dashboards that, that we've built, and it's just. It's just pen to paper, um, and you know th that's one. And, and our end result hold, kind of comes out. Oh, go ahead. Hold, hold it up again. I, I just spotlighted you. Okay. There you go. Can nice. you see that? It's better and than I can draw. <laughs> <laughs> and the end result, if you could see that, ended up looking, you know, something like this, which not too bad, not too far off, right? So yeah. super helpful in instead of kind of going in blind as I began development, um, actually taking the time to think about it ahead of time. All right. So that's tip number one it, it is the concept of wireframing. So tip number two is do not underestimate how important contrast can be. Um, and as you start moving, you know, from your black and white wireframe, the next logical step, right, is adding and choosing color. Um, and one thing that you should be thinking really hard about as you move into color is, is contrast. Um, so if you remember that Edward Tufte that I was talking about before, his quote about ensuring that your dashboard is understandable and consumable within 10 seconds or less, 
if you have poor contrast uh, on a button, for instance, the one on the left there, that takes me as the user an extra second to process what it says. Now I only have nine seconds left in my attention span and I'm 10% less likely to adopt the dashboard that you built for me. So if you think that your button, your card, or, or whatever other UI component you're working on has moderately enough contrast uh, between the background and the content on it, it needs more contrast. Uh, you know, fire it up as much as you can and build out that contrast to make it incredibly obvious uh, to the eye as soon as it hits the page on, you know, what the content is that you're trying to present them with. So my third tip is to tell the story quickly. Um, if you want to tell a story with data, you know, don't expect the user to, to choose the right drop down slicer selection to find the story that you're trying to tell them. You really have to put it right in front of them, at least at the start, and then maybe allow them to, you know, change, slice, dice uh, the data, you know, in other ways to get to maybe sub stories underneath that. But, you know, you're building this dashboard to hopefully present the story behind the data to them. You know, these are people pot potentially if they're in upper management. Um, that really want to understand the point as quickly as possible because their time is limited. And a great way to do this is through color or transparency. Um, I think that that tool that Graham had just shown us uh, with the x-axis shading on one side or the other is actually an incredible tool that we now have in Power BI to be able to do some of these things and highlight particular points of our visuals that we want to communicate really quickly. So if you're not a fan or a reader of the New York Times, you know, you might be missing out on some great data visualization, uh, which is where these two charts are from here. The chart on the left, you know, just uses a darker colored bar to make its point that, that the biggest drop in kindergarten enrollment is happening in the poorest neighborhoods, right? I, I got that from looking at this chart within five seconds. And the second chart on the right has, you know, a bunch of lines on this line graph representing a, a bunch of different countries but to get the point across, they used color and transparency, uh, color first to highlight what they want to draw attention to. And then they use transparency, those gray lines in the background to make sure that the rest of the data is available to the audience, um, but it doesn't pollute the overall message. And I'll bring up another dashboard that we had put together. Um, this isn't as exciting as the one that Talon presented on COVID, which was, was for the state, um, but we did one just for, for the town that I live in, uh, in Connecticut, which is a small farm town um, called Ellington. And you know, this is tracking COVID statistics as well um, using state data. And originally I had this uh, cumulative chart on the bottom, actually on the top of the page. It was the first thing that folks saw uh, on the top of the page. These, these charts were switched. And the feedback that I got, this is the cumulative number of COVID cases in our town, right? And the feedback that I got uh, from users, they were asking me, hey, I just wanna see the number of cases yesterday, or I just wanna see the number of cases before. So I said, you know, oh, if it's cumulative, you can just kind of take the difference between uh, the most recent day's cases and the previous day's cases, right? Um, but I realize that that takes time for a user to have to do, and it's not necessarily intuitive. So we switch these charts and put the most recent day's cases, put that difference as a bar chart um, as kind of the first thing that folks see when they log into the app. And the response now uh, on just such a small change has been, uh, you know, that, that this was a very impactful change to the folks using the dashboard, and it really increased our, our adoptability. Uh, when we started looking at some of the Google Analytics behind this. Can I ask a quick question on that? Yeah. Did you uh, solicit that feedback or did it just come to you? And if you solicited, then how did you do that? Oops, sorry. Um, so we did a little bit of both. We had we had put it on some Facebook town forums and we actually got uh, some comments uh, on our Facebook posts that we had out there of users asking this exact question. Um, but we did present this actually to, to folks in town as, as well, um, you know, in our town board of ed and, and in town government um, to see if this was going to be a useful tool for them to, to just help make some decisions, tell them that it was out there 
Um, and we got very similar feedback from them as well. Um, that the, the second graph, the cumulative statistics, uh, were a little less intuitive th than that first graph, which is kind of the first thing that everybody was looking for. Sorry, I think I lost it. But I think that probably your question highlights the importance of uh, communication throughout you know, any data project at all, I would say. You know, when you're building something for an end user, you have to have sort of a, a product management um, mindset to it and i think you know especially using a, a tool like power bi which does allow you to iterate very quickly and if somebody says hey i don't want a line chart i want a bar graph you know we can do these things very quickly and that's incredibly useful to us and i think that that should kind of spur on um, us having constant communication throughout our development process and not just after we've built the thing you know communication with the user that we're intending uh, this thing for, or communication with the person that that sent in the ticket asking for this particular dashboard to, to make sure that what we have in our mind that we're building is in line with their expectations. Any other questions? I guess I can pause for a second. I know I've been yeah, going a little like, quick. Yeah, this, this is great. Um, actually, I had a similar experience with an incredibly un, unusable report that you know my town you know board of ed put out there, and of course I had to recreate it and send them the version that I wanted <laughs> to use. Uh, I'll have to dig it up because it, it really it was it, it points out many of the things that you've identified as problematic. There's a lot of bad data visualization out there. There's like a Twitter account that I follow, I think, that just tweets out like terrible data visualization that they I see out that there in the wild. Yeah, and it's fine because I mean this is how people learn, right? So the more exposure Absolutely. they get, you know, the, the the next report ends up being that much better. You find out tips and tricks, and this is this is how we recruit for the user group. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. You got to start somewhere. Okay. Let's see. So I guess my my next tip um, will actually lead us into Power BI. I know I haven't shown any Power BI yet, so you're all probably saying, finally. Um, so in terms of coloring that we'll go back to, Power BI has some built-in themes um, that are mostly just color palettes, but they can give you some options other than the default color palette you know, that we get nowadays with the, with a couple shades of blue um, as the first two bars, and then I think the third bar is orange or something like that. And we can take a look at that on our view panel here, if we hit this drop down, we can see that there's a few a few built in themes and I might be one month behind in my, my Power BI, so maybe there's a couple more. Um, this is the default one and if you look at that, the actual colors of this theme, they line up with the colors of the bar, right? We have the light blue, if you can see my mouse, then the, then the dark blue as the second bar and then the orange is the third bar, if we had a third bar. So this is the, the default that we're using now. Um, we can just select another one if we want here. And it is good to note that this theme will apply to all pages of your report as you um, select one. We also have the ability to create a custom theme. So if I want to um, you know, customize my current theme and, and instead of having you know, light blue as the first color, I really want uh, hot pink instead, I can just click the drop down on color one um, change it to, to hot pink here. I can click apply and that'll update um, those those charts there. So I'll talk about uh, maybe in a second how you know this can be applicable um, to maybe your internal marketing department or color palettes that, that your company or organization um, may want to may have already that you can leverage as you develop within Power BI. Uh, So we can also borrow, you know, in my case as a consultant, I can borrow from, from my client um, or I can, uh, you know, if I'm not a consultant and I'm an employee, you can borrow from your, your organization and their marketing department or maybe if they don't have a marketing department because you're small, um, other potential places that you can grab some some colors from, some color palettes from that will kind of look uh, like, like a branding exercise as you develop uh, your Power BI report. So if I am working on something for Talon, I can actually go to their website 
if I'm in Chrome, I can just search the, this, uh, this color pick eyedropper, which is a nice little Chrome add-in that ends up right up here. And I can go to Talon's website. I can click on this color pick eyedropper. It'll give me this, uh, this, these crosshairs that I can drag anywhere over the page. And as soon as I click on a particular space, it'll give me this, this six digit hex code um, that I can use that you might be familiar with. You know, this isn't just a Power BI thing. This is, you know, Microsoft Paint. This is pretty much any, any product um, that uses color at all can accept hex codes. So I can grab this, this blue hex code from their, their top banner here, and I can actually use that instead as my first color in my theme. So if I want to customize this current theme and change, you know, orange to this six digit hex code that I just copied and pasted, uh, it'll give me this Talon blue that I pulled just off of their website here. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll do that as the first color so we can actually see that, that change. I'll apply that. And now kind of my, my base color and my color palette um, is that, that blue from their, their website's header. And I could go all throughout their website, right, to, to maybe grab the purple here, which will be another hex code, um, and add that to all the other colors in my palette as I continue to create my, my custom theme here. So that's a handy little trick that I've found useful in, in terms of making my Power BI report that I'm presenting to the client feel like it's theirs. And most marketing departments have a color palette that they have these hex codes, you know, maybe six or 10 of them available um, that you could use that, that goes a long way uh, with your company's brand. And again, achieving that, that goal of increasing adoption um, as much as possible, making it as likely as possible that the thing that we put out and that we, you know, poured our blood, sweat and tears into is actually going to get used by somebody, you know, on a day to day basis. So we can also borrow from um, you know, real life web developers, front end people, um, user interface creators. And they have this framework of tools called, called Bootstrap, which is kind of the most popular um, open source toolkit. And under the hood, it's really just a bunch of ugly HTML code you know, for formatting, styling components on a website, like buttons, check boxes, drop down menus, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but if we look at kind of one of the most common, you know, bootstrap themes from across the web, which is, is this bootstrap theme, um, we might be able to notice some components that we are familiar with um, when we kind of navigate the web on our day to day basis. You know, th these buttons look like things that we kind of interact with uh, on a day to day basis. You know, nav bars at the top of a web page. Um, if we go down, we can see how. You know, most front end HTML uh, engineers build cards. You know, there's kind of already this set framework for building cards out there. And, you know, if we look at, you know, some of these kind of existing tools that are already out there, can we try to recreate these in Power BI so that our Power BI content feels familiar to our users? Again, you know, kind of with that end goal in mind of, of making, you know, this, this Power BI dashboard that we're creating feel like something that folks are already using. You know, I'll use Facebook and Instagram as an example because, you know, people log into those, you know, quite a bit on a daily basis. But, um, you know, the, the user experience that people use, you know, in the apps on their, on their phone or on a day-to-day -day basis, um, m many of them leverage these web development tools. So if we can kind of build our Power BI reports with that in mind and maybe create some overlap and familiarity with the tools that they're using, again, that might hopefully uh, improve adoption for us. So, you know, we could look at a potential card like this card right here, this, this nice red one, and we can, we can pretty much recreate this in, in Power BI, right? I, I, we can bring in a Power BI card here. Uh, we can, you know, provide a title for that that I already created. We can make the background color of that title. Um, a little darker than the rest of the card. So it does look like that HTML component that we were just looking at. You know, we can make sure that we build in enough contrast between the background and the numbers that we're presenting. Um, and we can try to make it kind of look and feel like, you know, these, these, these web UI components uh, that we're also familiar with looking at on a day-to-day -day basis as we navigate the internet.
this might be a really specific use case question. Yeah. Um, but I wonder if you've come across it before, coming from a company whose brand color is red and trying to customize um, a theme with graphics where red feels bad in the 10 second rule. Yes. Uh, it's a it's a unique issue, but it's something that definitely comes up often. Yes. <laughs> no, that's that's a phenomenal point, right? And, and I, I think, you know, kind of when you're thinking about backgrounds in general and, and content in general, you kind of have to do in every other approach, right? So if you're, if you have a, a red background or a dark background to start, then if you put a visual on that page and you want it to, to stand out, you're going to want the background of that to look pretty much the opposite, you know, maybe white or, or black or whatever is the, you know, kind of the biggest contrast to red. Um, that you're going to want it to kind of be the opposite of whatever your page background is. Um, and then on top of that, the, the actual lines or dots, you know, within that visual need to be essentially the opposite of uh, the visuals background, if that makes sense. So as you build layers, you know, from, from back to front in terms of the way that the user consumes the content, um, you, you kind of have to think, you know, each one needs to be the opposite of the layer that it's underneath. Um, I don't know if if that's helpful approach. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to to try to achieve that. Um, I think I have maybe an example of kind of a red background right here, right in my Power BI report, where the contrast isn't isn't great. I would like to see a little bit more contrast in the axes, the white labels um, versus the you know the the light red background. Um, I'd like that to be a little bit stronger, but sometimes you're stuck, you know, kind of at the mercy of whatever the the actual hex code, whatever the actual brand color is of the client that you're working on uh, is. So sometimes you have to take some liberties, and sometimes, you know, I would go even as far if it's really going to, you know, make your life super difficult as you develop your report to navigate away from from maybe that base color um, that seems intuitive to use because it's you know kind of the lead in their brand's color palette but maybe just make a home page in your report that in incorporates that color and, and maybe use the the second um, the secondary color from their color palette instead as kind of the the basis for the rest of your report pages that you're building visuals on top of Yeah, I think we ran into a similar issue with uh, like um, I think it was Johnson and Johnson actually, because I mean their you know Johnson and Johnson logo is red. Uh, we we also I think used a lot of grays, um, um, and then you know, kind of reserved the red for um, things where you wouldn't necessarily confuse it with bad, like like a trend line, you know, on a like a bar chart, um, you know that one wasn't as bad but you're you're right there's certain cases where we did have to reserve i think it was a, we used a, a different shade of red that was a little bit more um you know uh, yeah. i think it was a little darker or something like that and, and kind of set yep. that pattern that's a great question <laughs> so one of my favorite tricks um, that you know that I'll I'll lend out here. Some of you might be familiar with, but it is to use actually PowerPoint um, to mock up the page layout, and then fill in Power BI visuals on top of that. And you you might kind of ask why PowerPoint, um, and I find that it, that it's just a really nimble tool for working with shapes, fill colors, transparencies, shadows, all those different things. And it also has many built-in icons to choose from. You know, I know uh, Graham was talking about maybe the, the, the five or, or 20 or, or whatever it is shapes that exist in Power BI now, but there's there's so many more uh, to choose from in, in PowerPoint, which can help kind of quickly improve that user experience and, and quickly translate, you know, what you're trying to tell them and, and the different places that they can navigate on the page. Um, so we can take a look at this, you know, example PowerPoint slide that I, I put together to use as a Power BI report background. Here. So these are all just kind of you know shapes with with shadows that I put together on top of each other. You know the shape format pane has a ton of different options um, for me to choose from and use. And I also have icons in uh, 
PowerPoint and these tools within Office that I can choose from to really hopefully show uh, the end user, you know, hey, by clicking on this particular icon, it'll take you to this place. And by t clicking on, on this other icon, it'll take you to this other place. And if you, um, you know, s select an icon, insert an icon here, you know, you have hundreds, if not thousands of different icons uh, to choose from to build into your report. So if we're, we're doing something like building out a dashboard of COVID cases and I have, you know, multiple pages that I want to create bookmark links for, you know, I, I might have a home page, I might have a page that shows positive tests um, or, or maybe confirmed cases. And then I might have another page that just shows the count of all tests, you know, positive and negative. And I'll, I'll want the user maybe instead of having to, if it's somebody who's never used Power BI before, uh, I'm going to want to make it as intuitive as possible to them uh, on where to click in, in order to get to the things that they would want to see. So the way that we actually can do this here is we can save, um, maybe I'll, I'll use this second one here, and we can save this particular slide as a, an image file, a, as a PNG. So if I save a copy of this and instead of, um, let me call this background two, and instead of saving it as a PowerPoint, I'll go down to like a PNG file here. I think JPEG would work the same, um, but I'll just do PNG. And I'll call this background two. It's going to ask me if I, I want to export all slides to this image file. And that, that doesn't really make sense because it's an image. So I'll say just this one. And now I actually have, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Now I have this, this PNG file here called background two that I can bring up, which is no longer a slide deck, no longer a PowerPoint file. It's actually just an image. And the aspect ratio is pretty much the exact same as you know the, the, the tile, the background tile within Power BI. So I can go to this page here. I can click the format pane before I've brought any visuals in. I can go to page background. And instead of selecting a color, I can add an image. So I can grab that background image two that I have, make sure there's no transparency on it to trip you up. And now I can build my visuals, you know, right on top of this. I can I can copy this this line chart from the previous page, and I can stick it, you know, right in here. Um, which also helps, you know, it, you do have the option right of, of using Power BI's built-in shapes. Like if I want to insert a shape here. Um, and instead of using this PowerPoint background, you know, I, I want to create my cards out of Power BI shapes. What you have to deal with then is all, all this formatting of sending things backwards and bringing things forwards and going into your, you know, selection pane here and making sure that you you have everything ordered correctly um, so that you know the right visuals on, are on top of the, the correct backgrounds um, and things like that. And, and by using just a, that PNG file on that picture as an image for our background. I don't have to worry about that at all because those, those shapes don't exist to Power BI. I can layer all of my content right on top of, uh, you know, right on top of these visuals here. So, so the way that you would probably do that, I guess if I'm gonna go from scratch and create a new card, you know, I can take just kind of the, the total number of new cases, right? It's gonna show up um, with a white background to start but just switching that to a transparent background um, and, and maybe changing you know, the color of the data label allows me to make it look like this is a card that, that's built kind of the, you know, built as a dashboard. Um, and, and folks won't even know that kind of behind the scenes, you know, those are two separate things. Hey Mike, can I add something here? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I, I really like that you're talking about this. This is like awesome and something that I've actually been using very recently and one way that I'm using it is PowerPoint also allows you to you know duplicate slides and you can have multiple slides with the same format and just change the color on shapes or the color on a background and I've been using that so that if you click a button that navigates you to a different page that shows a you know, slightly different source of information or tells a different story I can kind of have different coloring but not have all of these shapes that I'm keeping track of and all this conditional formatting on, on those shapes. It's just part of the background image. And then I use a PowerPoint slide deck to kind of control where all those images are stored. 
Absolutely. That's a great approach. Yes. Yes. And I think maybe one thing that you alluded to that I'll point out here, just in case, um, you know, folks aren't familiar with it is, you know, now that I have these icons here, I can take a blank shape and kind of use that as a, as a bookmark now that shapes are, are linkable. So if I just grab a, grab a square here, I'm going to put this over this positives icon that I built out in, in PowerPoint. Um, I'll take the fill out of it. I'll, I'll take the outline out of it, but I'll, I'll make an action down here over in the pane. And, and I will say, hey, if somebody clicks on this particular shape, uh, take them to uh, this cases page. I'm going to rename this really quick. Take me to this cases page. So we'll make the action page navigation. We'll make the destination cases. And maybe we can put a little tool tip that says click me to view cases. So that when the user is interacting with this on the online Power BI service, they hover over, over this button. It says click me to view cases. And if they click on this button in the Power BI service, it's going to take them to this, this other page that we had built out. And, and you know, that, that's really, really intuitive. It's, it's the way most web applications work, maybe that they're familiar with working with, it, it, you know, in terms of clicking buttons to get to different places or clicking icons to get to different places. If you're thinking of, you know, the bottom of your Facebook app and you're navigating between your, your news feed, your profile, you know, the marketplace, your messengers, things like that. You know, those aren't titled report pages like we see in Power BI. Those are all just icons that you're clicking on that are hopefully intuitive to you to let you know kind of where you know where the linkage is um, behind that that button. So I think this is a super powerful you know approach, especially to folks who aren't familiar with Power BI, to maybe get that buy-in and get that adoption a little bit quicker um, th than you might otherwise. So I, Jared pointed this out to me that you can actually, I think, buy or download um, online PowerPoint decks that are like supposed to be um, Power BI backgrounds. If you go to Power BI tips, uh, Power BI dot tips, I guess, is the website here. Um, and, and I just went to shop layouts. Um, I think you can download some of these. And I, I haven't really tried yet, but we want to just let you know that that this is out there, that there are people who are, you know, providing a couple layouts here on the web for you to use uh, as your Power BI report backgrounds, if you're interested in exploring that. So I'll just touch on maybe a couple more things uh, to consider and some sources of inspiration that I used. You know, you might be surprised how much dashboard design inspiration is just available out there online, um, even just using a Google image search. But one of my favorite places to find design inspiration is Pinterest boards. Um, my wife gets a, a real chuckle out of that whenever I'm logging on to Pinterest. Um, and I can just type in dashboard design in, in Pinterest and I can get, you know, a, a bunch of different images that I can click on and you know, it's not downloadable. It's not something that, you know, I'm going to export right into Power BI. But if I'm struggling, you know, with a little writer's block in terms of coming up with how I'm going to maybe lay out um, a report or, you know, kind of the color contrast or color theming that I might want to use for a report, I'll go on to Pinterest and I'll, and I'll surf the web a little bit to get some of that inspiration, um, which I think is, um, you know, kind of a, a cool, unusual source of, of finding um, finding some inspiration for your dashboard design. I'll say, you know, don't over engineer your dashboards wherever possible. Use the, the KISS method, the, the keep it simple, stupid method um, as much as you can. This is the point in time where we get to the bad data visualizations, but I cannot figure out what's going on in this chart uh, under, with, under 10 seconds. Um, uh, as a personal note, the, those combo charts with bars and lines uh, scare the heck out of me. Uh, I try not to use them wherever possible. Uh, don't tell Power BI that because I know that is an existing visual. Um, but 
keeping it simple, I, I think is super important. And here's another example, you know, where we have a, a pie chart um, where it, it's, there's way too many categories in this visual where it's absolutely impossible to compare two of these smaller categories against each other or, or even try to consume, you know, all of the information that's on this pie chart within 10 seconds. Um, I'm lost. I'm moving on to the next thing already. And I would bargain that you're, I would bet that your end user is probably going to be doing the same thing. It's color overload. The other thing that I would, I would throw out there, you know, when thinking about, you know, using red, green, yellow for, for good or bad is that 8%, which is kind of a, a surprisingly large portion of the population um, of, of Caucasian males, at least, are red, green, colorblind. I guess it, it's dominant in, in Caucasian males. I think it's less than like a quarter of a percent in, in Caucasian females, and most other ethnicities don't struggle with red, green, colorblindness to the extent that um, Caucasian people do. But um, that might just be a good question to ask if you are you know, creating a Power BI report that's going to be in a board of directors meeting with 20 uh, directors, you know, there's a fairly good chance that at least one of those people might be red, green, colorblind. Um, and if you do have a chart that's trying to show, show good or bad, you might want to provide some other visual aids in the legend um, or, or, or something like that that allows them to consume, you know, your color scale um, you know, for those folks who, who wouldn't be able to consume it based upon the color itself. That's a good point, Mike. And there's a bunch of other accessibility features that Power BI has, like for to support screen readers. Like when you um, created that invisible button, I love the fact that you put the tool tip that says click to go to cases because that immediately gives the option for somebody using a screen reader to, yeah. to understand what that's doing because they can't tell the context of there's something behind it they're clicking on. Absolutely. Yeah. Accessibility, I think, is a topic that's becoming more and more present for good reason. Um, so I think we're going to see accessibility being, you know, talked about about more and more and become more important in this space. That's a great point, Jared. Uh, one other thing I wanted to share, because, uh, you know, Emma had asked about using red to indicate bad. Um, and I mentioned the Johnson & Johnson uh, situation. I will add that Johnson & Johnson, since their brand is all about nurturing, they um, they try not to have negative things on their dashboards. So like the lowest sales, they would rebrand that as like top opportunities, you know, and, and kind of put a positive uh, spin on it. So maybe that's something to consider. Absolutely. I think a lot of the times, at least for me, you know, as being technical people, probably a lot of us came out of Excel going to, to Power BI, getting lost in the data. We don't use that other side of the brain very often. So um, you know, that, that's sort of the inspiration for me even putting this presentation together today. But as an aside, I always find so, some of this stuff seems probably simple to a lot of people out there, but I always find a ton of value in just kind of coming back to, uh, you know, some more non-technical things, some more of the creative side uh, of design. And this is, this is very Power BI specific, but, uh, I've found that 99% of the time, nobody wants a bunch of visual headers all over the page in the online Power BI service as they hover over you know, the particular visuals that you've built out. So um, if you've ever had that experience online where you know, you're, you're in the Power BI online service and you're consuming a report and you, you know, drag your mouse um, over a particular visual and you, you see these three icons in the top right, you're, you're always going to see these in Power BI desktop but you do have the ability to turn them off uh, at the very, very bottom of the kind of paint, paint roller formatter uh, pane that says visual header. And you can, uh, you can do a couple different things in terms of uh, changing the icons or, or color or things like that. But I like to, to turn them off completely. They're still gonna show up while you're doing development in Power BI Desktop. But once you push to the Power BI online service, they, they won't be there anymore. Um, and it'll feel much more like you know, you're using a traditional web application. So I'll, I'm just about to wrap up, um, but I wanted to give maybe one last opportunity for questions. Sorry, I know we went a, a little bit long here. I appreciate everybody sticking around. I'm gonna blame it on Graham. I have uh, two more design uh, tips as well, if I could share. Oh, please. 
<laughs> so yeah, you mentioned the themes, which are awesome. Uh, I just wanted to mention, like, you know, going into the formatting options of each of the, the Power BI visuals is is very time consuming, and you got to change fonts, you got to change font size, you got to do all that kind of stuff. So I just wanted to mention that a theme behind the scenes is just a JSON file, and you could export that, and you could actually set predetermined uh, formatting options for specific visuals. So if you want all your line charts to have you know, a title that is size 12 font and, you know, white, because it's going to be over a blue background all the time. You could also do that in a theme. It's just a little more work. Can yes. you also size you. column widths in a matrix visual? It's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, each of the visuals have their own configuration options, so I, I there's a good chance. And I think this is fairly recent that you can start to do some more of this stuff just oh, in, in the yeah. GUI, in the UI, right? You can select font sizes and font families and, um, you know, visual backgrounds, borders, headers, tooltips, um, you know, I guess page backgrounds, filter panes. This filter pane was always something that I never figured out actually until today when I would use some some background color from my report and the filter pane would would adopt that that color as well over here. And I said, let's say, I don't want that. I just want that to be white uh, and, and kind of separate and easy to look at. So I'm glad I figured that out uh, yesterday or today. Nice. Yeah, and the so, other one. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I wouldn't be surprised if if you can't set the default width. Yeah, so there's auto size column width. Um, so maybe that's um, an option. I'll, I'll drop a link in. I mean, it's enormous, <laughs> the, the, the size of these JSON files with all the settings. Uh, but take a look here, and good luck. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and then the last one, just to give some love to the data model and how it relates to design. Um, you know, if it, this is more like a self-service. If you're exposing the data set to people, um, it's really good to name your you know fields how you want them to be presented so if uh you have a measure that's total number of cases then name it total number of cases and then if you have new confirmed cases which i'm seeing on screen just name it new confirmed cases without the underscores and such that way when it's dragged on you don't have to do any work naming the title it's just it's ready to go so that's a little bit more yep. on the data modeling but a good uh you know it helps you in the design side of things as well. If, uh, if I don't know, I, I don't even want to think about the number of seconds total that I've spent renaming uh, visual, <laughs> <laughs> renaming fields in yeah. Power BI visuals over the years. So yes, uh, you, you could have saved me probably a couple years off my life. That's a great, <laughs> that's great advice. And then last thing, uh, Mike, that was a fantastic presentation. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Jason. Yeah, sorry for biting into your time, Mike. But no, was, no, I was, was just really messing good. with you. <laughs> I know. Yeah, really good. Thanks for uh, thanks for presenting. Sure. Um, so I guess maybe it's just some some last wrap up things. Uh, keep your eye out for UX function, you know, user experience functionality improvements from Microsoft. I, I think we're seeing them slowly but surely. You might not even realize maybe at first glance. Um, that this is something that that can uh, you know be a, a real user experience improvement to your end audience. But uh, you know, as Power BI tries to compete with you know all the other data visualization products out there, um, as well as web development, um, you know, and continue to be a no code, low code solution, I think they're going to have to continue to push updates around user experience and not just around technical um, improvements. So keep your eye out for that. I would say come to the next meetup, please. Uh, thank you everybody for coming tonight. Uh, you know, really appreciate Talon putting this on, um, and the the more the merrier. And I do appreciate all the questions that we had today. I think the more people that are here, the more opportunities for us to learn from each other. And lastly, if if you do you know feel so inclined to connect with me after this, if you have any other questions or, or comments or, or want to talk shop, pick my brain on anything. Always really enjoy doing that. Probably the best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Um, that's my, my LinkedIn handle right there. I'm Michael J. Thomas, number two. Couldn't get number one. Um, so Catchbrook Analytics, uh, you should find me there. So thank you again, everybody.
All right. Well, thanks, Mike. Um, and two, maybe that's like the just the the better version, right? So two point oh. Right. Um, as far as the next topic, I know we're over time. You know, I think um, if folks are you know willing to stick around, we'll continue going. And Sam, if that's all right with you, um, we are recording yep. it. So if you do have to leave, you could always come back and catch it. Um, uh, two pretty um, interesting topics. Uh, one of them relates to data flows and the other, the shape map visual, um, when you're creating your own um, uh, map kind of layouts for uh, your report. So I guess without further ado, Sam, you want to take it away? Yeah. Yeah, let me share my screen. Uh, thanks, everyone, for presenting so far. I think everything's been really good. Uh, so hopefully my presentation is on par. Uh, <clears throat> so the first thing we'll be looking at here is uh, shape maps. Um, before we get into the shape maps in particular, just to give you an idea of the data that we're working with, um, we'll be working with population data for towns in Connecticut. Um, so we'll have a town name, you know, a population count, and then lastly, we will have uh, a population group, uh, basically just an arbitrary grouping of, of where they, the town falls into uh, in terms of population. So the first thing that's uh, worth saying for shape maps in particular, these are a preview feature. So like Graham said, uh, you have to opt in to use these. So ultimately what you would do is click the file button in the ribbon and you have options and settings. And lastly, options here. Uh, you'll get a new pane here for all of the different options. If it wants to pop up, uh, and then a little bit down the left hand nav here, you'll have a preview features option. Uh, so you'll see here the first one is the shape map visual. So if you're going to use this, you want to make sure that it's checked. Um, so the shape map visual by itself, uh, if we were to select it here, um, ultimately you won't see anything until you drop some location related data in here. Um, you'll notice if I click the formatting uh, option here, it, it'll even say formatting options are unavailable for this visual. But as soon as we drop in, uh, you know, our Connecticut town into location, you'll notice the visual changes. Um, you know, in this case, it's using, uh, if we look at the shape here, it's using a USA states. And I didn't define the state that this town's going to. So it's, I guess, going to Washington here. Um, but the idea is we want to build out a chart here that's going to focus specifically on Connecticut and break down uh, you know, by town. So you'll notice here there's an add map button uh, under shape. And, and additionally, there's a bunch of different uh, default options for the map that you can use, but it's totally customizable. And the way that we customize it is through uh, what's called a topo JSON file. Now that file in particular, just to give a quick overview of what it is, it's a file that defines um, different arcs that will make up um, some subset of uh, a state, or even it could be the US. It, it, it could really be anything. Um, and the boundary of, lines. Yes, the about. boundary lines, yes. Yep. Um, and along with the boundary lines, there's, there's attributes that will go along with it, which I'll touch on a little bit later. Um, but in terms of getting data or getting this topo JSON file to create a custom shape map, uh, a lot of it's out there on the web. So ultimately what I did was a quick Google search for um, Connecticut town geo JSON. So oftentimes you may not find a direct topo JSON file, but there's a lot of geo JSON files out there. Um, and you'll see this is a good example uh, of what we may want our Power BI report or shape map to look like. So what I did was export this file. Um, and when we export it, you know, you'll see there's a couple of options here, um, but there's no topo JSON. So I ultimately go with the geo JSON option and uh, your best friend for custom shape maps or generating topo JSON files will be mapshaper.org. Um, so once you have that file, ultimately what you'll do uh, is you'll select um, the file that you downloaded. So we have our geo JSON file and we will upload that to this service. Uh, once we import it, you'll see we sort of have the same visual that we were seeing on the other page but we want to export it as our topo JSON. So we can choose export, select topo JSON, and then we have our file for Power BI. Now, 
once we get to the report, uh, we'll go back to this add map option. And similarly, we'll choose our new JSON file that we've exported from that site. And you'll notice immediately when I select it, it goes straight to Connecticut. Now, the only information we have in here currently is just the town. So you'll see all the colors are the same. Um, but what we'll do is actually go and add our population data in. So uh, we would be adding that under color saturation. Um, and you'll notice when I add that in there, we get a bit more of a better visualization um, where we can hover over different towns and see populations. Uh, one thing worth noting here with the shape map, uh, there's no way to do data label overlays. It really is just the tool tip that we have here, um, but you can certainly customize the tool tip uh, to a good degree. Um, now this by itself, you know, it looks all right, but we don't have a lot of information. You know, we have to hover over each individual uh, town here to view the different um, populations associated to them. And that was the reason why I created the population groupings. You know, we, we could, in theory, drag our population into the legend here and we get a little bit more information, but you'll see it just starts using a bunch of different colors to start categorizing things. And we sort of want to know um, what range do these towns fall into? So that's where our population group comes in. Uh, we can drag that in as our legend. And you'll notice here, you know, we have different groupings of how, um, how, how the population is for each of these towns. Now, uh, I think, you know, going back to uh, what Mike was talking about in his presentation, it would be great if I had done a theme here, uh, but I haven't. So something that's useful if you don't have a theme, um, you know, probably not a best practice. The theme is definitely the best practice. You can always go in after the fact and categorize your data colors in a little bit of a different way, um, or you could, you know, use the best practice of creating a theme pack to define these. Um, but that is how you create a, a shape map or a custom shape map at a high level. You know, the most important thing to know there is you could do this for any state, um, any country, you know, it's totally customizable. Um, and before I, I go on from this, one thing that I want to touch on is the importance of um, mapping to keys here. So with a topo JSON file, um, you get some attributes um, and a lot of this is going to look confusing at the top. These are the different boundaries that are being defined for each individual town. But at the very bottom of this file, um, you'll notice we start having listings uh, of objects. And this is actually what's being associated to those different uh, boundaries that are defined. So in these, and I'll try to find a good example here, uh, we have one, the objects here have two uh, attributes with them, one being the town and one being the town number. In order for a custom shape map to be able to display this information in the way that we're showing here, you need to make sure that the sort of location data that you're using is matching up to one of these keys. So in theory, we could have used the town number um, or we can use the town name. You know, it's not always going to be that the topo JSON file will have a friendly name here. So you need to be aware of, of the, the topo JSON file that you're working with and make sure that you're mapping properly to the entries in it. Um, I think a lot of the time, you know, you will have somewhat of a friendly name, but it's possible that this could just be some random identifier. So uh, definitely worth opening up your topo JSON file and taking a look at it yourself before you try to plug some data in, because you might be very confused when it's uh, when you're not seeing any any data really being displayed. All right. So are there any questions on the shape map? I know I ran through that pretty quickly. Um, but it actually is is fairly simple. I think the hardest part is really just making sure you get the right file for your uh, custom map. I'll just add, um, just because um, as as you kind of alluded to, it it doesn't need to be a map. This could be like a floor layout or like yes. a, a housing plan or something. It can be literally whatever shape you want. Definitely. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of uh, creativity you could you could use here um, 
you know, you might end up having to make topo JSON files yourself, but it's possible. All right. Uh, I will move on to the next section uh, for data flows um, and how to connect to them. So the biggest piece here, um, you know, by default, if you've ever worked with data flows in Power BI, you may be familiar with just coming to the get data option here, selecting Power BI data flows, which brings you up sort of this friendly window that allows you to select from specific data flows that you have access to. Um, now, uh, what I'll do here as an example is I'll connect to one in sort of this default fashion to show you how, uh, you know, behind the scenes it's actually connecting to these. So if I just choose a state, for example, from this novel coronavirus uh, data flow and hit load, um, ultimately, we can go take a look at how Power BI actually defines the connection. And the way that it's going to define that connection is through some uh, identifier GUIDs uh, for the workspace and the data flow that you're connecting to. So if I open the advanced editor here, you'll notice that this isn't the friendliest uh, query ever. Um, you know, for one, these names aren't great, they're basically just taking from what it's connecting to here, um, and it's using the GUIDs here. So, you know, someone who is coming into this report, uh, maybe to do development with me, you know, if I've already configured all these connections, if they go into the, the query editor, they may not know exactly what it's connecting to here. And there's definitely ways to figure out what it is connecting to. You know, you can go to the source option and, and dig into uh, the data flow it's connecting to and the workspace that that lives in. But what I want to introduce is a different way to connect here. Um, and actually, um, something worth noting, if I were to connect to multiple tables here, you would notice each individual table I connect to would have these same steps of connecting to Power BI data flows, selecting a source workspace, and selecting a uh, data flow within that workspace. Um, now, another way to do it, uh, and this is sort of uh, a best practices uh, way, at least in my eyes, from a governance standpoint, is to make sure that you're sort of abstracting out that connection. You know, reason being, if names change or, you know, someone deletes a data flow, you don't have to go and update each individual query. You'll sort of have a one-stop uh, area that you can do that update. So what I like to do when I connect to data flows um, is I sort of have a template uh, for a query that I use to connect. And the difference here is that uh, we'll actually be connecting by the workspace name and the data flow name rather than the GUID identifiers for them. So it makes it a little bit easier for someone to come in and know what you're connecting to. Um, I will paste this template in the chat as well, um, but it follows the same general steps as, as the, the out of the box connection. So we'll have our connection to our data flow. We will have our connection to our workspace, and we will, or uh, then we'll have ultimately the connection to the specific data flow that we're looking to utilize. So you know the the biggest difference being you know we have the ability to sort of have better names here for our individual query steps, and we can reference the workspace names and the data flows by name. So for sake of example, uh, I've already created a workspace that has a data flow out there. So I'm just gonna input some information here. And um, after I do this, I'll show a little bit of a better way to do it uh, from a deployment perspective, but this is just a quick example for this template. So if I were to connect to this in this way, ultimately what you see is I sort of get to a step where I have a listing of the different entities that are within this data flow. Now, like I said, you know, if a workspace name or a data flow name were to change, we wanna make sure that that step is one area in our uh, report. Um, so what we're actually gonna do is utilize the reference capability of queries uh, to sort of create new queries with this as the source step. 
So if we right click here and we say reference, um, you'll notice we're at the same area that we saw in our prior data flow query that we created. Um, but if we hit the advanced editor, you'll notice now the source step is simply just pointing at that query. So if anything were to change in terms of workspace name, data flow name, all we would need to do to fix that is come back to our original query and update the names that are in here. Um, now, you will have to do this for each individual entity that you want to pull out of the data flow, um, but it's a pretty quick process. All you need to do is reference, select your specific table that you're looking to work with. You know, I'll use a country as an example here. And then, you know, as a best practice, you just want to make sure you rename your queries to match the table that you're connecting to. Um, so I will connect to one more here. Uh, just for sake of example, to go through the steps again, you would reference, then select your table, and then rename your query to match the table name. Now, this is all in great. Um, you know, this is a step in the right direction to make sure that uh, you have some capabilities of, of connecting easier through some strings uh, for workspace and, um, and data flow. Uh, but something worth keeping in mind is, is deployment of this uh, data set that we may be creating to the Power BI service. Um, if we have, say, different environments, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using a Power BI premium example here of using deployment pipelines. Um, if we have different environments, workspaces, and you know, we're going to have a development, a test, and a production copy of this uh, COVID data set. Um, what we want to make sure is that the specific environments data set is pointing at the correct environments data flow. So something with deployment pipelines, if you're familiar, and, and I'll pull it up here just to um, show a quick example, uh, is there's a little lightning bolt with deployment pipelines for deployment settings. And um, you know, this here is my data flows workspace, but what you'll see is if you click on, you know, if, uh, actually what you'll see is there are deployment rules and oftentimes the deployment rules are really just defining specific parameters that you're using within a, um, a data set or report. Uh, now, you know, reason being, if I have a development copy of a data set and a test copy of a data set, we have the ability to parameterize the connection that we're making um, such that when we push development content to test, we don't have to do any manual changes after the fact to repoint the test data set at the test data, because it's always going to take whatever's in the report from dev or, um, or whatever's in the report from test pushing into the next um, environment. So oftentimes, you know, I've seen with with some clients, they get caught up on this and and they have, uh, you know, three different data sets that they believe are, are dev, test, and prod, but really all of them are pointing at prod because they hard coded uh, their their values here um, for like workspace name, or this could even be a connection string to, um, you know, a, a SQL database or something along those lines. So. You know, as a best practice, what I would recommend is rather than hard coding these values here, we actually have the opportunity to um, create some parameters for them. So using the manage parameters button, uh, you know, we can come in and manage the different parameters that we have. You know, the important piece here is we want to create a workspace name parameter. Um, you know, another thing with deployment pipelines, if you're not familiar, uh, you won't be able to set parameters uh, in deployment pipelines, uh, deployment settings, unless you explicitly make the type text. Um, I've run, I definitely run into that myself, and it's <laughs> it's quite frustrating uh, trying to figure that one out. But it's just a little caveat to keep in mind. So in this case, we're just going to put in our value for our workspace name. And similarly, we will create a data flow name parameter. Make it type text and we'll input our current value.
once we've done that, uh, you'll see they pop up as queries here, and we want to make sure that we reconfigure our data flow to utilize those. So what we'll do, uh, and this is just syntax to reference a parameter in this query, you'll put a little pound sign, and then you'll specify your um, parameter that you're trying to connect to. So here we're going with workspace name, and down below we will have data flow name. Once we hit done, you'll see it's got the same connection. It's now just utilizing our values from the parameters. And now just to show you how this is used in deployment pipelines, I'm actually going to publish this up to the service and we'll take a look at what, what it looks like to actually define um, these deployment pipeline parameters. So we'll just give this a moment to load here. Um, if anyone has any questions about anything that I did, now would be a good time to ask. Um, otherwise, I'll continue on. All right, so we'll save our changes. Uh, call this COVID data set. And ultimately, we'll publish it up to our workspace. So once I get the publish window popping up, I will look for COVID data sets. You'll notice right now I only have a development copy. Um, I won't go too much into actually creating the test and production copies, but uh, deployment pipelines will do that automatically for you. So if we come back um, to our workspaces, you know, we can double check, make sure that our data set space now has our um, data set that we just published out that wants to load for me. Uh, you know, something something worth noting, even if you don't have any visualizations, you'll always see a report, you know, you can always delete this, uh, which I'm going to do. But ultimately, you know, the, the key here is the deployment pipeline. So I don't have one currently, but I'm going to create one. And while you do this, uh, deployment pipelines are a premium feature. Yes. Um, but there's other ways to achieve, you know, what Sam's going to demonstrate here. Um, just takes a little bit more work, just about like everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So uh, right now I'm just creating the other um, other workspaces for test and production. You know, it's a click of a button. Uh, it's not anything overly complex. Um, but the next step here, you know, to make sure that um, whoever's using or updating this data set um, knows that it's pointing at the correct uh, workspace, it's pointing at the correct environment's data, data flow. Um, we want to define our parameters here. And it's not actually, let me take a step back. So the, the importance of the deployment settings here are to make sure that when changes are deployed, we're not overriding the connection that we're making to our data source. You know, if, if we weren't to have any deployment settings here uh, right now, um, you'll notice that if I were to go into a test or production uh, data set right now, it would be pointing at the development copy of the data flow that we're looking at. Um, development is never going to have this option for uh, deployment settings. So, you know, whenever you're developing a new data set that may be connecting to a data flow and you're using parameters, you know, you don't need to worry about it in this uh, environment. It's it's more important to define it for the test in production environments. So when we click this lightning bolt, you'll notice here now we have our COVID data set that we just published up. If we select this, you'll see we have parameter rules um, and we want to add some in. So in this case, the parameter that we want to use is workspace name. You'll notice that it's automatically detected that this was what was currently in the report or in the data set, but we want to make sure that this is pointing at test. So we'll simply change our string here, and then we know that uh, we're looking at the correct workspace. Um, in this case, I actually did name the data flow the same in all of the environments, so we won't actually have to change anything here, um, but it's worth noting that even you, you can continue to add rules for as many parameters as you have. So if I save this, we now have we now know that um, this test environment's 
data set is pointing at the test environments data flow. And similarly, we would do the same for production here. Come in, choose our data set, open up our parameter rules, add our rule in for the workspace name. Again, it's always going to point out what was deployed to it, so it's going to say development. We change that to production. Sam, you could, if you wanted, not have this one called production. It could just be yes. COVID data yes. flows, right? Definitely. So. Definitely. Um, now, once we've done that, um, you'll notice that it's saying there's some differences between this, uh, which is true. They're pointing at different environments. Um, but if we were to deploy to test, or you know, if I hit this deploy to test, um, this test environment will still be pointing at the test environment's data source. Similarly for production, once we deploy, we'll get the same deal. And just to show you that it has stayed correct, if I click the deployment settings and come back in here, you'll notice this is still pointing at the test environment. Um, now, just as sort of a final way of showing you that it really is pointing at test, uh, you'll notice when I was creating the report, um, I had refreshed the data flow. Um, so when we looked at our data view and looked at country, for example, we have some data in here. Um, now, if I was to come into my test workspace, I did not refresh this data flow initially. We should see no data in here. If we do, then I mess something up, but <laughs> let's, let's take a look. If we say create a report and we put a table visual and choose some fields from country. You'll see that there's no data in here showing that it is indeed pointing at a different environments uh, data source, which is what we're looking to achieve. And you know, this is the biggest thing here is ease of deployment. You know, you don't want to have any manual steps of having to go into a data set and reconfigure data source connections. Uh, with these parameters, you have the ability to basically just deploy your changes from dev to test to production um, without needing to worry about where it's going to get its data. Are there uh, any questions about that process? I, I ran through it pretty quickly, so definitely feel free to uh, ask. And oh, actually, great. let there me post a... that template in the chat as well. I was going to say there's a few features I hadn't seen yet when you were assigning the parameters. So. Um... Yeah, definitely a pretty powerful capability. Um, something that we're using at a number of mostly larger corporations, but you know, smaller corporations can benefit as well, especially if you have you know, very strict uh, regulations that you know, require segregation of duties because you know, the person, for instance, doing the promotion environment to environment may not even have access to the, the data sets themselves. So this is another exactly. reason why these are great. Yeah, definitely. I wish they had something like this for reports because the the rebind is can be a pain, but it is what it is. Well, if you run into that, Sam can help you as much of a pain as it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely can. Um, I do like that data flows is in here now, though. I've been I've definitely been waiting for that myself. All right. Uh, All I just right. Sent that template in the chat as well, so it should be out there. All right, I anybody, any other questions for Sam or otherwise? I know we're, uh, we went you know, fairly over, but yeah, some great material for sure. All, All right. right, well, I won't take everybody's time to kind of recap some of the you know typical pug activities but look for an uh, invite probably in the november time frame i'd imagine um and uh you know we'll uh hopefully you know see you all there and if not you know feel free to reach out if you have any other questions or anything in the meantime all right thanks thank so much you. for uh, having everyone. me tonight Jared. yeah thank sure. you yeah it was a great presentation mike yeah. All right. Thank you.
Have a good night, guys. Good Thank night. you. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye.